My name is Terry Ross, the director of the Hunter Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Haskane School of Business at the University of Calgary in Alberta, Canada. The goal of the Hunter Center is to bring thought leadership and programs to catalyze innovation skills in our students, faculty, and our community in Calgary, as well as across the world. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's presentation by Dr. Jeremy Hall, Director of the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex. Today's event will be an engaging and entertaining discussion on the topic of great importance for all of us concerned with universities and their role contributing to knowledge-driven economic growth and helping society. Now, before we begin, the Haskane School of Business would like to take a moment to address and memorialize an exceptional person who inspired many of us here today, Cooper Langford. All of us that had the genuine pleasure of knowing Cooper remember his gentle charm, his unfathomable wit, and his endearing chuckle. I personally met Cooper over 20 years ago. I was a precocious undergraduate in his science, technology, and society classes, where I became enthralled by concepts Cooper shared about triple helixes and creative destruction, and the story that they told about the ability of societies to upgrade themselves with purposeful innovation. I've kept my textbook from 1998 from Cooper's class because it meant that much. And Cooper embodied innovation and his lessons elevated the thinking of many a student, including my own. Now, humanity has never needed an ethos of innovation like Cooper's more than we do today. So thank you, Cooper, for all that you brought to the world and to the inspirations that you brought to the University of Calgary. You are dearly missed. So for all of you across the world that we welcome today, we here in Calgary understand the urgency of innovation and will champion it in the memory of people like Cooper, especially in the decades leading us all to 2050. Wherever you might be, please never underestimate your agency nor your ability to inspire innovation in those around you. Today's event is being shared across the world and is hosted by the University of Calgary. And we acknowledge that we're hosting this event from the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising of the Siksika, the Kani and Kainai First Nations, the Tsutsina First Nations, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Peter Josty. Peter's been the Executive Director of the Center for Innovation Studies, or THESIS, since 2001. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with THESIS, it's an innovation research company that conducts economic research with an innovation focus. It engages academic, business, and policy-making communities through workshops and conferences. And it also provides graduate student education on the fundamentals of innovation. Now, prior to THESIS, Peter worked in the Canadian chemical industry, holding positions ranging from research chemist to head of strategy and planning. And in these roles, he was practitioner of innovation and led numerous new product introductions uh, into the North American markets. Peter has a PhD in chemistry from the University of London and an MBA from IMD in Geneva, Switzerland. It is now my pleasure to pass control over to Peter Justin. Peter? Thanks, Terry. Uh, we're here today, as Terry mentioned, to remember Cooper Langford. Cooper was born in 1934 in Michigan, where his father was a professor of logic. <clears throat> he studied chemistry at Northwestern University and at Harvard, where he spent most of his time working in the radio station rather than on his studies, he told us. After that, he did a postdoc at University College London, uh, mostly in Lab A1, which by coincidence, is exactly the same lab in which I did my own PhD in chemistry 10 years later. Cooper taught at Amherst College and then came to Canada where he taught at Carleton University and Concordia University, where he became proficient in French. He became director of physical and mathematical sciences at NSERC before coming to the University of Calgary as vice president of research. He maintained a very active research lab whilst VPR, and mentored many students. From, <clears throat> from a professional point of view, Cooper was very successful. He was a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He published over 370 papers, uh, wrote a best-selling textbook on inorganic chemistry. He had very wide interests covering photochemistry, environmental science, and 
most relevant for our topic today, the sociology of science, innovation and entrepreneurship. From a personal point of view, as Terry has already said, Cooper was a very, very pleasant person, easy to work with, great sense of humor, always willing to offer advice and go to bat for people he felt had been treated unfairly. I first met Cooper in 1999 when he had just stepped down as Vice President of Research and I had just left Nova Chemicals. We had a shared interest in innovation and its impact on society and decided to jointly found an institute that we called the Center for Innovation Studies, or Thesis, and we wanted to model it loosely on SPRU, the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex that was seen as the world leader in this field. One of the first things I did when I was to visit SPRU and see what they were doing. And whilst I was there, I met a young Canadian academic called Jeremy Hall, who was just about to move to the University of Calgary. Cooper was very active at thesis right up until his death. He lectured at the Science to Society workshops, the Banff Innovation Summits, and wrote numerous reports for the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor program, and was a board member for 17 years. Cooper died exactly three years ago today, on March the 11th, 2018. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Jeremy Hall, Jeremy, uh, who's our speaker today. Jeremy is director of SPRU, the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex Business School. He's editor-in-chief of the Journal of Engineering and Technology Management. In previous roles, he was at the University of Surrey, the University of Nottingham, Simon Fraser University, and an associate professor at the Haskane School of Business. Jeremy has broad research and teaching interests, including the social impact and unanticipated outcomes of innovation and entrepreneurship, sustainable supply chains, social inclusion, strategies for sustainable development innovation. His work has been widely published. Jeremy was a collaborator, mentee, and friend of Cooper Langford. So please welcome Jeremy Hall. Thank you very much, Peter. It's um, wonderful to see everybody again. It's been years since I've been back to Calgary. The intention for this presentation was to do it in person. Uh, unfortunately, that was not the case, but however, we are able to have so far 175 people participating, which I think is, is perhaps even a better idea. So at this point, I'm gonna share my screen. And I'm hoping everybody can see this. Oops. So as Peter mentioned, Cooper was uh, my mentor. He kept me out of an awful lot of trouble. He kept me on this clear and straight path. He also was very instrumental in much of the research that I ended up doing and I continue to do here at SPRU. But I think most importantly, he was a really dear friend and I was really disappointed I was unable to attend his, his memorial service. So that's what we're planning to do now. And what I'm gonna be doing is following up some research that Cooper and I had done. We're looking at the future of university research lessons from the United Kingdom. Just a quick background uh, where I work now. I'm at the University of Sussex Business School at the University of Sussex, which was founded in 1961. So we're celebrating our 60th anniversary this year. Uh, SPRU was founded in 1966, so we're 55 years old, and the University of Sussex, was, the business school was actually founded in 2009, so currently we have these following departments, finance and accounting, marketing and strategy, management, economics, and of course SPRU. SPRU was actually founded by Chris Freeman, the pioneer of innovation studies, and one of the first to advocate for interdisciplinary problem-focused and empirically-based research on science and technology policy and innovation management. A lot of people don't remember this, but he actually was the guy that advocated for uh, how you can use indicators to count innovation, such as R&D expenditures and patents. He called for accountability of public research funding. Uh, a number of the major projects that we've done in SPUR over the years includes Project SAFO, which was a study on industrial innovation which was really the foundation for early policy and technology management courses, uh, the early capabilities perspective and strategy that's now diffused around the world with uh, 
uh, Beckman Lundvall, he coined the phrase national systems of innovation, which has also been widely used. You'll see over the years that Sprue has changed its corporate uh, or its, uh, its logo, but in the, in the meantime, it's had a, a very healthy and vibrant trajectory. One of the things we participated on in the 80s was lean production, the International Motor Vehicle Program that was in partnership with MIT. This is a, a, a approach to manufacturing that we've all heard of now, and it's been widely diffused around the world. We've had the Harvard Sussex Program, which is an interdisciplinary collaboration between Sussex and Harvard for informed public policy on chemical and biological weapons. The founder, Julian Perry Robinson, of the Spruce side actually passed away from COVID last year. So we're having a celebratory event in the fall. I'll get to that later on at the end of the presentation. We've also done pioneering research on technology foresight, complex products and services. We have one of the world's largest energy groups, one of the most successful as well. The publications that we're getting from this and the grants that we've been awarded in recent years has been actually quite remarkable. And I'm actually hoping that there could be some opportunities for collaboration because I know that um, Alberta in particular is undergoing some major need for a transition in this particular area. We've also had uh, award-winning SPRU IDS. IDS is our partner institute at, the, at Sussex, Institute for Development Studies, the STEP Center. Most recently, we, we've been working on deep transitions for sustainability and transform, transformative innovation policy. And this is only to name a few. One of the things that Chris actually pioneered that we still do today is that we focus on problem focused, interdisciplinary, empirical, and critically analyzed research and policy and managerial relevance. Now our actual operations model, our business model, if you, if you want, is actually quite different than most business schools around the world. Typically what we do is that we apply for grants and we hire faculty based on whether or not they're able to fulfill the roles required by the project. So that by nature typically makes us multidisciplinary. So most business schools hire based on teaching need like many other departments and other universities, but SPRU is a little different in this end. And what this is, uh, does is it allows us to, to constantly win these grants because we're much more suited to what they're looking for. I call this a SPRU research engine. And what this does is it persistently reinforces our mission and allows us to legitimately respond to pressing societal needs such as post-pandemic restructuring and SDG goals. So our mission and our business model is actually well aligned. This also allows us to engage in pioneering research informed teaching in emerging fields. So we're one of the first schools in the world to offer a science and technology policy degree. Sustainable development is one of our fastest growing areas right now. We have one of the world's most successful energy policy degrees. Strategic innovation management is originally technology innovation management, one of the pioneers in that area. So um, that it, for me is very important. Our mission is aligned with the way we do things, which is aligned with the way we teach things. Currently we have, well, we're almost at 80 faculty members now actually, and we're supported by many external grants. We currently have a research portfolio of about 18 million pounds. 5 million of which was awarded last year, and we're on track to win more this year. Uh, SPRU is a founding institute of research policy, which is currently the only ABS four star and Financial Times FT50 ranked journal that focuses on innovation and is based in the UK. We were also the founding institute for social studies of science, industrial corporate change, and current home to numerous other journals. Our researchers publish in a wide range of business school journals, ABS and FT ones, but we also do a lot of publications in the core STEM journals, including science, nature, nature, climate change, nature, energy, nature, sustainability. And I wanted to make reference to environmental science and technology because Cooper was on the editorial board and one of my colleagues got a publication in there last month. And you'll actually see that um, SPRU research is, when we say we're, we're multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, we truly mean it. You can just see where we're publishing. And oftentimes these are in the very top journals in those fields. And this is represented, for example, by having on a regular basis, at least three members of SPRU faculty make, that make the top 1% most cited professors every year. So getting onto the actual research at hand here, this is based on a study that was actually published with, uh, Cooper was the lead author, with me, Peter Josty, who introduced me, Stelvia Matos, my wife now, who's uh, hopefully on the call right now, 
uh, and Astra Jacobson. And it was actually edited by Luke Ledesdorf, who I'm hoping is in the room today. So if you are, thank you very much for editing this. Um, it's, it, it, it was a great thing to get me started in this particular trajectory. I'm also actually hoping that Martin Meyer would be here, but when I asked him to participate as a senior administrator at the university, he's working late. So hopefully he'll be able to show up at some point. The focus of this particular paper was exploring how proxies for university knowledge transfer often miss important paths of knowledge flow. And one of the things that we observed is that the readily available proxies are from aggregate data and failing to reflect the idiosyncratic and path dependent nature of innovation. If the goals or incentives in the triple helix actors are skewed, then universities may engage in counterproductive activities. Now, as always, Cooper had great respect for students, and he emphasized that they are perhaps the most important mechanism for knowledge diffusion. What I'm gonna be doing is talking about the UK system. So why are we actually looking at the UK system? Well, it's been on the leading edge and perhaps even the bleeding edge, which is something that Terry once told me back when we were young upstarts at the University of Calgary, a phrase that he used. Innovation is oftentimes on the leading edge, but it's oftentimes on the bleeding edge. And this is truly the case for the UK. So UK universities have long been a template used around the world. They've been pioneering university formats for about a thousand years. They've actually recently uh, um, embraced abrupt changes to tuition and therefore their business models. They've gone through an incredible period of domestic growth and as well as international growth. They've continued academic achievements. So this includes Nobel prizes and significant publications. So my university claims to have five Nobel affiliations at some point. To the best of my knowledge, we can claim legitimately three, three people have won Nobel prizes while employed at the University of Sussex. Another two had worked there at different points. One of them actually claims that he was not able to study at the University of Sussex because he didn't meet the entry exams. And he later won a Nobel prize in chemistry, which is quite, quite remarkable. Um, increasing pressure is, uh, is become huge in the UK for impact and accountability. And I'll go through some details about how that's evolved over the years. So 50 years of science and technology policy has made universities key players in the UK national innovation system, perhaps more so than other leading economies where we typically don't have uh, a lot of research institutes. They're now mostly embedded within the universities. So something I want you to ponder as I go through this presentation is what's the role of university research for post-pandemic recovery and how can Canadian universities evolve to address these and other pressing societal challenges? So UK universities, I mentioned before, they're key to the country's science and technology policy. And much of this research I've done with the help of Ben Martin, who was a former director of SPRU. In the 1800s to 1960, there was the so-called red brick era. This is where industrial city institutes that were originally specialized in valued skills, training and knowledge were then converted to universities. So this was typically in engineering and medicine. And this expanded university research beyond the ancient universities, the original six, particularly Oxford and Cambridge, which I'll henceforth refer to as Oxbridge, the common term that's used over here. In the 1960s, they created these new cutting edge universities, which were called plate glass universities that were named after the architecture, Sussex being the template, the first template founded in 1961. Uh, plus other universities were created from tech colleges, doubling the UK capacity. In the 1970s, there was a phase of selectivity and concentration. So there was an acknowledgement that the, that the UK can't do everything. Under the Thatcher regime, there was a heavy emphasis on economy, efficiency, and effectiveness. So the idea was to get value for money. Um, another thing was a much more closer engagement with the private sector. So you leave near market research to the private industry with the intention that they would eventually commercialize it. At this point, there was many institutional closures, a lot of privatization, mergers with the universities, and there was a first attempt at assessing research in 1986. In the 1990s, there was a conversion of polytechnics and other institutes into degree granting universities, which trebled the UK capacity. And then in 1992, there was the first formal research assessment exercise. I'll spend a fair amount of time talking about that because that's actually had a big influence on how the UK does research. So this just gives you an example of how things had grown. Up until 1960, 
there was 24 universities in the country. During the 60s, another four, it, it rose to 47 universities. So a doubling on that front. Then in the 90s, the polytechnics and other, other trade or colleges were converted to universities. So trebling the amount. So you can just see this phenomenal growth in universities. So there's now currently uh, 145, but by the end of the 90s, there was 120. So that's a very sharp increase in institutions, university degree granting institutes. In 1993, there was a white paper published realizing our potential. And the point here was a revised social contract for science. So in return for public funding, researchers responsible, were responsible for engaging with users and ensuring that results are taken up. I mean, this could almost be a textbook definition of what innovation actually is. In the 1990s, the EU framework programs were established and the UK was often consortia leaders. So during this period of time, it was oftentimes the big universities that were based in the UK that were actually dominating much of the research that was going on at the time. In 1994, something occurred called um, the creation of the Russell Group. This was a self-selected association of 17 universities which later merged to 24. And at the time, there was a question as to how they were selected, whether they were actually the best to do it. It seemed a bit of an ad hoc association. However, there was a responding group called the 1994 group that was established that were composed of smaller research intensive universities. So we had these two main components of the research groups. There was a Russell group and the 1994 group. In 1996, there was another research assessment exercise. And here what happened is that they shifted from pure volume, which was the previous exercise, to one replaced by quality. And that had some serious implications because it increased the amount of bureaucracy it takes to make these assessments by actually reading the papers and determining their value. It also added some complexities and some difficulties about how do you actually assess quality research. The bureaucracy started to kick up here. It became much more cumbersome to do. In the 1999, Tony Blair set a 50% target for young adults going into higher education. And during this time, shortly afterwards, there was a 10-year framework for science and technology with the point of long-term stable government funding to enhance UK competitiveness. Uh, in 2001, the RAE was modified to avoid staff poaching and other gaming. So one of the things that I find really interesting is that when you create various proxies, actors typically try to manipulate them in their favor. This is a natural human behavior. And I've since published a couple of different things on this particular case. And I used to joke at the time that it would have been easier rather than poaching everybody and moving everybody in the country around so you could count their publications, you should just take the names off buildings and put them on the other buildings that you are planning to pro poach from. It would be way more uh, cost effective and much reduced transaction costs. So the RA was intended to actually reduce that. And then another accounting mechanism came out, which was the National Student Survey. This was in 2005. And what this does is that after students graduate, they do a survey to determine how, how satisfied they were with their student experience. So we've got research assessment going on, plus we have student experience assessments going on as well. And all of this creates a significant amount of bureaucracy in 2008 was the last ref and it was later replaced by the research assessment framework. In 2010s, we had something called uh, the impact agenda, which ensured UK funding research generates greatest economic and social impact. This resulted in the 2014 REF research assessment framework. And the idea was to provide accountability for public investment in research, establish reputational ER6, and to uh, efficiently allocate resources. Now, to the best of my knowledge, nothing like this has actually happened in Canada at this level. When I was going to, when I was studying in Canada at Dalhousie University, about the best we had to measure, whether it was research quality or whether it was rankings, was the Maclean's rankings, which is nothing compared to any of the things that we, we've dealt with in the UK. This was something that actually had a fundamental shift in how universities operated in the UK. In 2010, undergraduate tuition was raised from 3,000 pounds to 9,000 pounds. That's in one year. This excluded Scotland and Northern Ireland, but it shifted the business model of most universities. Tuition 
Often that was allocated or was generated through government student loans replaced much of the core funding. So research funding came through grants such as uh, UK uh, research and innovation, as well as EU money. It required cross subsidization from tuition. So usually what happens is when you apply for a UKRI grant, which is kind of the equivalent of the Tri-Council in Canada, you need to kick in about 20%, roughly 20% of the full economic costs. And this is done through tuition revenues. Fees were capped. Now this created a problem because university costs typically go up year on year as people, as there's inflation, as people's salaries increase. However, they were capped and they were not able to change. There was actually only one period when it changed and it's now currently 9,250 pounds. So there's actually few options to keep up with inflation be, be beyond increasing enrollments. So this started triggering a growth phase in universities where in order to stay still, you had to recruit more students. In order to grow, you had to create a substantially more student enrollment. CAP excludes foreign students, however, so they can charge whatever, foreign students can be charged whatever they, whatever you could get from them. And this was driving internationalization, especially in the booming Asian markets. Another thing that's quite unique, I believe to the UK, I haven't seen this in any other country, is that student rights are actually legally enshrined under the Competition and Markets Authority that happened at this time. There's a logic for this. If you're paying 9,250 pounds per year, for your degree, you should have certain rights. However, this has created an enormous amount of side effects, one of which is if universities promise something and are unable to deliver it, students can actually sue to get their tuition back. And this sometimes goes down to very granular levels. So if you claim you're going to give students feedback within 15 days on their exams and you fail to do so, the first thing they do is they say, well, I want my tuition money back. Um, there's increasing influence of rankings. This is all part of the growth model. How do you get more, more people to come to your university? Well, get well ranked. So there's the QS rankings. There's the NSS scores that were that I've mentioned before. So the higher NSS scores, the more likely you are to get better quality students and a higher volume of them. There's also a phenomenon of recruiting agents. Typically, this was in Asia where um, the recruiters would actually, for a commission, send students to your school. And this oftentimes in some universities shifted, I believe, the balance between what we believe we should be offering and what they believe would, would actually be of interest to their students. So some universities, I believe, actually shaped their course offerings to align with whatever the recruiters wanted. And this actually was driving growth sectors, particularly business schools. So before the tuition hike, universities could operate in a healthy way without business schools. After the tuition hike, if you didn't have a business school, you're almost certainly going to run into financial problems because business schools generate a lot of cash uh, and they can they can scale up quite easily. And there was a huge demand for it. So that's one of the reasons why the University of Sussex operated a business school or opened a business school around that time, because if you didn't, you would probably end up failing. At this point, though, it also raised more explicit cross faculty subsidization. So students were aware I'm paying this amount of money. Uh, am I subsidizing other departments? So that also added some more questions. Now, on top of the NSS, on top of the REF, on top of the other accounting things, they created even a newer one called the Teaching Excellence Framework, the TEF. This was in 2017. So universities that perform well, it was gold, silver, and bronze, were actually supposed to be able to increase their, their fees. So this was built in to allow the increase in fees. So I think more so than most countries, what's happened in the UK is that the relationship between teaching and research is extremely complex, but self-supporting and oftentimes contradictory. And you'll see what actually happened on the side here is that the Russell Group changed quite significantly, where a number of the now defunct 1994 group joined the Russell Group. Now, at the time there was invitations to join the Russell Group, Sussex was offered a position, but because they founded the 1994 group, they decided they didn't want to join. But what I find really interesting is that that time, that would have been around 2010 or even perhaps earlier, nobody quite realized just how important being a member of a club like the Russell Group or the Ivy League would be under this context of, uh, of intense recruiting. So now I think the universities that chose not to join are actually regretting it. I'm just going to give you some graphs here. This is uh, the number of universities. So from uh, 
1096 to 1592, there was only six universities in all of the UK. Four of them were in Scotland, the rest of the other two were in the UK. In the 19th century, there were 15. From 1900 to 1960, there were 30. From 1961 to 1991, there was 45. By 1992, there was 125, and today there's 145. And that only tells part of the story. So Tony Blair's objective to get 50% of the student population has achieved. Uh, when Cooper and, and Peter Josty, when they were at university in the UK, there was actually less than 4% that were actually in, in the entire UK population that went to university. And now there's 50%, which I think is a remarkable achievement. But even that doesn't tell the full story. If you look at the actual size, the number of students, it's vastly increased from, from less than 200K, 200,000 people in the 1960s, actually up until about 1990 to a million by 1992 to two and a half million today. So of which about half a million of those are international students. And it's the international students that provide the cream that allows for sophisticated research, expensive research, because they pay typically double the tuition. So now here are some of the contemporary issues that we're dealing with. I'm sure everybody's heard of Brexit, these are uncertainties. Uh, Brexit, when, when the European, or uh, sorry, the United Kingdom decided to leave the, the EU, this created considerable uncertainties over EU funding. So these problems have now been resolved. However, I have to say they really left it to the last minute. It was only a couple months ago, it was in December that they decided that every, everything was gonna be fine. This created a lot of uh, problems for us in the UK. We actually had one colleague who won a 9 million euro grant he was going to apply from the UK, and then we decided that it would be better for him to apply for a Danish university, which is what he ended up doing. So that's uh, some of the problems that we faced. Apparently now we're able to apply for EU funding, which would be quite good. There's also implications on student demand. So in the past, EU students were regarded, they paid the same tuition fees as home students. Uh, but this is changing, and I'm still not exactly sure what the implications of that are going to be, whether there's going to be a mass drop in foreign students or in European students, because they're going to have to pay twice as much. We've already encountered visa issues, uh, less appealing post-degree uh, career opportunities, because you won't have the right to stay. Hiring has actually become quite difficult and much more tricky than it used to be. Another major issue that's uh, happening is increasing competition for the already maturing Asian student markets. Uh, the Asian markets was what was driving a lot of this growth, particularly, particularly China. Has that been stabilized? There's new technologies that may make that less uh, relevant, you know, the actual visiting on site. So what I've suggested before the pandemic was that we were probably entering a plateau in the growth phase. And then, of course, COVID-19 hit. And this had uh, around the world a major impact, but perhaps a very explicit and blatant impact in the UK. So there was closure of campuses and the shift to blended learning, which exacerbated many of the uncertainties. So I think that's pretty common in most countries. However, what it really did in this country is it actually cracked open how the business model works and the vulnerabilities that we, that we face. So there was threat to tuition and rental fees. We generate considerable revenues from accommodation. Students actually, there was a long period where students were actually trying to figure out whether or not they would be able to go to university. And if they did, should they be paying full fees? Uh, there was a major government policy that actually said that, uh, there, that the universities were not in breach of student rights. So they didn't have to pay back their tuition, but it was pretty close. Public accountability for universities is extremely high. There's legal and consumer rights of students, which was constantly in the news about the issues that they're facing. Other universities were threats of bankruptcies. So the vulnerability of tuition subsidies for research also exposed, also became, showed an exposure. So there was actually a time, SPRU last year had its most successful year in its history. And at the same time, that put us in a, probably one of our most vulnerable situations because at one point we may have been perceived to be too, uh, too successful for our own good because we need to cross subsidies from collapsing teaching revenues. Fortunately, that didn't happen because we ended up, we, you know, the teaching got resolved here in the UK and particularly at Sussex. But I have to tell you for a while there, it was very, very uh, disconcerting. So uh, the international markets, however, are still suffering. And this is where uh, the more lucrative end of the market came from. 
So one of the things I'm actually suggesting is perhaps the growth phase is over and it's now time to consolidate. Now, this is the HARE report, Higher Education Restructuring, uh, which is actually a document that's readily available. You can easily access this. And it's actually quite disturbing what's in it. If you read it, it's, it's much harsher than most policy documents that I typically come across. So if I may, I'll just say due to COVID-19, uh, uh, COVID-19 has had a profound effect across our higher education sector. Okay, clearly it will continue for a long time to come in ways which we cannot predict with certainty. So a big issue here is the uncertainty that we're actually facing. Providers need to look not just to weather the financial storm, but also to emerge in a stronger position to contribute to our economy and society as the nation recovers from the pandemic. So increasingly we're seen as having to be more efficient, but we're also increasingly being seen as a mechanism that has to contribute towards society, which perhaps we should always have been doing, but that pressure has just been exacerbated. So the mandate of HAIR, of HAIR is to protect the welfare of current students, to preserve the sector's internationally outstanding science base and support the role of higher education providers in regional economies through the provision of high quality courses aligned with economic and societal needs. It is not a guarantee that no organization will fail. Now, I actually found this document very odd because there was many double negatives in this. And this one looks like a double, double, double negative. But the underlining message is, if you're not useful, you will not survive. So increasingly, we're gonna be under pressure to make sure that we're doing things that actually helps the economy restructure after this terrible pandemic. Just to show you some more graphic things that have come out of that report, the conditions imposed, and these are on universities that are, that are having financial problems and are requesting government assistance, will be designed to ensure those providers make changes that will enable them to make a strong contribution to the nation's future. We need a future higher education sector that delivers the skills the country needs. Universities should focus more heavily upon subjects which deliver strong graduate employment outcomes in areas of economic and societal importance, particularly STEM, nursing, and teaching. So public funding for courses that do not deliver for students will be reassessed. So at no point have I ever seen such a threatening sort of tone, a strong tone. So there's calls for enhanced regional focus with a more strongly applied mission firmly embedded in the economic fabric of their local area. But at the same time, they're claiming they want a commitment to academic freedom. So I found that reading this document a bit disturbing. On the one hand, they're telling us to do this. On the other hand, they're telling us that we still have academic freedom, which is making me think we need to reassess what we actually mean by academic freedom. Another problem that I found almost hypocritical was that a lot of the uh, universities have been accused of high administration and bureaucracy costs. Um, vice chancellors earning a lot of money, higher levels, much greater uh, uh, layers within the organization, all of which I think there's some fairness to that. However, most of this has been in response to the enormous amount of government regulations that's been imposed upon us, the, co the consumer rights that we have for the students, the, 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 the research assessment activities that we have to go through. Uh, ultimately, the major, it's, there's going to be a major refocusing of the university, uh, UK university business model. So I'll just try to explain quickly the support for universities. There's actually two main entities. The first is core institutional funding. This is actually done primarily through how well universities fall on the research assessment exercise or the REF. So the two components are grants, which is similar to the Tri-Council in Canada. And the other one is the core institutional funding. The core institutional funding, most of it is derived from how well you've done on the REF. And what, what's happened here is that this is part of the accountability. Universities that have done well in the past will get money to do well in the future. Increasingly narrowly defined research outputs have also become the norm. So they have a ranking system. It's a four point system out of five, which I know sounds a little crazy, but the ranking system is four star for internationally renowned world-class research. Four is pretty much the same, but not quite as good. Then there's three, two, and one. So they rank the papers to determine how well those papers are perceived by the committee. And these are extensive, huge exercises. So we actually have somebody in SPRU that's on the REF uh, exercise this year. 
So 40% of his workload for a year will be dedicated to this one particular exercise. And he's only one committee member. There's actually universities talking about gaming the system. There's universities that I've heard as a rumor that employ people that make papers ref friendly. I think there's been a recognition, particularly in the larger fields like business schools, that there are far too many journals for people to actually read carefully and understand fully to determine whether or not they are actually outstanding world-class papers. So what they, they suspect is that people are scanning the uh, abstracts. Uh, so they actually get people to, they call it to make the, the abstracts ref friendly. So they, just before the paper is accepted, the abstracts are, are modified to make sure that it's clear for the ref assessors. I'm not sure how true that is, but it's one of the rumors that I've heard going around about how the more sophisticated universities are, are, are actually dealing with, with ref, the ref issues. There's also a growing emphasis on impact for industry policy, uh, for regional trade, for uh, other issues and benefits to the UK. So most recently, the ref has placed a much greater emphasis on what's called impact case studies. So these are a separate stream of evaluations on how the research has resulted in, in impactful research. And on top of the REF and the CAF, they now have another one that they're proposing to come out with called the Knowledge Exchange Framework, the CAF. So that's, that's going to be our third major assessment, which is directly uh, related to how well universities are actually able to engage with uh, their communities. Now on the grant side, again, this is similar to what we would have in Canada with the tri-councils. What's happened in the UK is that there's increasing selectivity and concentration. The success rates are declining. So for a while, the grants were getting larger, but fewer people were getting them. So the success rates are now less than 20%. There's been a growing emphasis also on impact. So one of the things I'm pondering is the days of academics determining what's interesting. Are they actually fading? And I would say they have been fading for years in the UK. And I would say perhaps they're gonna fade quite rapidly uh, as we respond to dealing with uh, scarce resources being allocated for research. The other element I wanted to mention was dependence on student recruiting revenues to support research in a post growth uh, era. So scaling up student enrollments without increasing employees may no longer be an option. As I mentioned before, it seems like we're plateauing in terms of how many students can be recruited. There's lowering entry standards will likely widen the gap between teaching and research, increasing in men and bureaucracy and thus reducing time for research. And it may erode strategic coherence or institutional logic. In my experience, lower quality students are actually more demanding, take up more time or more problematic and more difficult. And perhaps more importantly is that they're not that interested in the research. They don't see the point of the research. So what ends up happening is that you end up losing institutional logic. But without research, the downward slope will only get more slippery. So any university that claims to be a research institution that's focusing on, on uh, higher recruiting by lowering the bar is simply gonna put themselves in a worse situation. I think an alternative here is that this may call for a distinctive research informed teaching approach, which we've always done at SPRU, but that could be the main way you do it. So either be best in what you do or get out of it. The point I wanted to make here is likely every pound spent will need to show benefits for post pandemic and Brexit restructuring. This is going to become the main agenda for the next couple of years. So here are some troubling trends and perhaps some opportunities. Since 2010's policies have encouraged increasingly concentrated research in top universities, the so-called Locksbridge or Russell Group. Uh, the pandemic could exacerbate this trend, contradicting government calls for regional development. Large research consortia dominated by Locksbridge will scale up be needed to play, resulting in need for mergers or acquisitions or even closures. Does increased demands for engagement impact value for money, accountability, bureaucracy, enhanced student experience, pressures from REF, CAF, TEF, NSS, the rankings, treadmills, this all may require scale or there are going to be opportunities for differentiation. And this is kind of where we are now. Uh, are we going to have to scale up or are we going to be in differentiation? Is there opportunities for greater specialization? So the painful process of picking perceived winners, it could be difficult. In other words, are we going to be setting ourselves back to the 60s? Now, this is what just came out a couple hours ago, which was quite disconcerting. This came from UKRI. 
which is the, the equivalent of the Tri-Council in Canada. And what they've actually said is that they've just made a major cut in a program. So uh, it, it, it is happening. So some quick implications, the need for post-pandemic restructuring will likely create both significant challenges and research opportunities for universities that are willing and capable of stepping up. So basically universities uh, are vital for the UK's science and technology policy and drivers for innovation, perhaps more so since industry will need time to recover from the pandemic. There will be fewer, larger, more ambitious grants targeting specific policy needs so things like climate change, next generation technologies, new trading partners, but they will have to fill the Brexit void. We're gonna need a replacement for much of the business activities that we're gonna lose because of Brexit. And also to recover from COVID and hopefully spawn a more sustainable economy. So the government has made commitments for research that would encourage more a green economy. Let's hope that that doesn't get thrown under the bus during this time when we're gonna encounter some difficulties in terms of uh, research funding. I mentioned this before about reconceptualizing academic freedom. Nobody's actually telling us we're not allowed to do what we think is important. The question is whether they're willing to fund us. And that's where one of the main challenges that we're facing. So while there's explicit calls for increased global engagement, many of the issues we'll face are global and thus call for international collaborations. One of the things that we're actually promoting is what I call screw I, the I standing for internationalizing. So the idea is to take our model of problem-focused interdisciplinary empirical and critically analyzed research of managerial policy relevance to our partners. So we're trying to be the right researchers at the right time. And in order for us to actually take advantage of the many opportunities that are popping up, perhaps one of the most effective ways for us to do this is to collaborate with people uh, in other universities, both within the country, but generally internationally. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I was so excited about the opportunity to come here today. So I'm just gonna leave this. I think my time is well up. Um, what is the role of university research for post-pandemic recovery and how can Canadian universities draw a ball to address these and other pressing societal challenges? So UK universities, as I mentioned at the beginning have long been a template used around the world, including Canada. Have Canadian universities been responsive to changing societal needs? I can tell you one thing. Canadian universities have not nearly undergone the amount of change that's occurred in the UK. And hopefully my presentation clearly showed that. Do funding agencies need revamping? So I've actually had the honor to work on a number of Genome Canada grants when I was working in Canada. And one of the things that they really focused at this time was benefits to Canada. Has this actually been enough? Has this been effective? Um, the other thing is, do Canadian researchers need better performance measures? And in contrast, do you wanna create what's happened? What I think is over here is where the proxies have gone absolutely wild, taken far out of, I, I've joked with my colleagues that you know, we're gonna, pretty soon we're gonna be spending 10% of our time doing research and 90% of our time measuring how much research we've actually done. That seems to be the balance that we're going in. Now that is a bit of a joke, but there's a bit of truth to it. In Canada, have there been adequate academic achievements? Has there been enough Nobel prizes, significant publications? Are you part of the conversation? Are you able to actually develop solutions? I mean, one of the things that's happened here in the UK, which I'm sure you're all quite familiar with is that the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, that, that was university research, partly because we didn't have many other alternatives. Most of the great research going on in this country is happening in the universities, but it's not common for that to happen somewhere else. Are you actually able to be on the world stage? And I know many of my colleagues actually are, I have one person, this sounds a bit trivial or a bit silly, but his research is actually being retweeted by Leonardo DiCaprio. In the meantime, the nuclear in industry is saying horrible things on Twitter, which to me is a spectacular success for impactful research because they're part of the argument. So I just wanted to leave on one last note, and that's that do we need more bridging mechanisms like thesis? I think thesis is an ideal situation for what's going to be happening in the near future. If you're anything like you are, like we are here in the UK, there's an expectation that your research is actually gonna be doing something useful for policymakers and for industry. And I believe thesis has always had that mandate. So I'd just like to leave with this last slide. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I've been looking a long time to try to do something for, for Cooper. So I'm delighted I was able to do this at this point. And I'd like to invite you to our celebratory events that we're gonna hopefully be having, you know, pandemic, uh, assuming that the vaccines are gonna be in place by that time. So we have Chris Freeman's 100th anniversary and memorial for his centenary. 
Research policy is actually celebrating its 50th anniversary. The university is going to be 60 years. And I think the idea that we're trying to do is that the last year and a half have been horrible. Let's make sure that the fall turns out to be wonderful. That's all I have for now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeremy. I have um, one question for you. I think we have time for just one question at the moment um, before we wrap it up. And it's actually building off of your uh, second last slide a little bit. And if, if we are to assume for uh, a moment, Canada's post-secondary institutions and universities are gonna be following along a similar trajectory to the UK's. And you've given some, some, some thoughts here on this uh, slide I'm pondering, but I'm wondering if you might take it even a little bit further and, and, and say like, what kind of advice would you want to perhaps give university leadership or policymakers or others that might help guide them to the most productive uh, evolution of universities to be competitive in the decades ahead? That's a really good question. I, I, would, I, I would do benchmarks of what other countries have done, and I would be particularly cautious about uh, the gaming of the system it, it, to be pragmatic. You set up systems and then by nature, people tend to try to figure out ways that they can actually enhance hence their particular institution around it. So that's one of the main things I, I would recommend that you actually do is to look what's actually happening uh, in other countries. My suspicion, certainly when I worked in Canada, the tendency was always to look to the US. Uh, you know, that, that's it. Uh, the, what the US is doing is actually driving what's going on. I would suggest, I mean, there's obviously ex excellent research going on in the States, but their system is actually quite different uh, and I would say that when it comes to innovative behavior, both for good and bad, that the UK is a much more interesting place to see what's actually worked and what hasn't worked. Does that help with the question or? Oh uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Be Thank careful you. of the gaming. I think that's, that's the key takeaway. Be careful of the gaming of the system. I mean, one of the things I joke with our colleagues is that we used to talk about the research that we were doing then we talked about where we got published. Now we just talk about how it's ranked. So people say, I got a four-star publication. They actually don't say what the publication was about. And for me, that's, and these are my close friends. These are my good friends and I've done it myself. And I think that's absolutely insane. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much uh, for that thought provoking, very timely uh, presentation, Jeremy. There's a lot there to unpack and I'm sure we're gonna be looking at this for a while. Uh, I'd like to mention to everybody that Jeremy uh, it was actually my MBA thesis supervisor back in the day, and uh, he also had a really enormous impact on what became possible in my career and my life. So I, I want to personally thank you, Jeremy, for everything that you did for me, uh, and uh, I wasn't the easiest student, I'm sure. Uh, I also want to thank Peter uh, for what you've done with thesis and uh, catalyzing innovation in Western Canada. It has never been more urgent, and uh, I suspect that the best is yet to come for thesis. I'd also like to thank our Haskane staff who worked really hard on putting this event on smoothly and while learning the ropes of a new platform. I'm very, very fortunate to be part of such a group that has passion for innovation and perseverance to get through snafus that help us to uh, innovate and bring new value to you all. I wanna thank you, our guests, who spent time with us today. Nowadays, your online options have never been deeper and we're honored that you've chosen to spend your time and attention with us. Thank you.